Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 102. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes and you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick and TidyX is on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained and TidyX is at Gmail at tidy.explained at gmail.com. Uh, of course, you can go on the GitHub repo and open up an issue if you'd like, but the most popular way for people to connect with us is YouTube channel, like and subscribe, and drop your comments and questions under there. And one of us or the both of us will try and respond and maybe turn an episode into your question. Um, also, we do have a Patreon page and we appreciate those um, who have contributed. If you enjoy our work, you find it beneficial, and you'd like to support us in any way possible, um, we welcome that as well, and we appreciate um, all who have done so. Yeah, we definitely, definitely appreciate it. Um, it's also been great. We've been great getting some great comments over the last few weeks, um, so it's been a joy for, I think, the both of us to read those, see how they're actually helping people, that they're, at, like, we put these out here because we think it'll be helpful to people, but we don't know unless you comment or send us an email and let us know how helpful it is for you. So um, I've, I know I've really enjoyed some of these comments lately. Um, so getting back to what we've been talking about. So we've been working on learning a little bit about Bayes um, yep. and Bayes theorem and whatnot and learning about um, conjugate distributions and, and how they're related. And so now we're going to go into a new distribution that we haven't talked about yet. Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about that as I go to share the screen? Yep. So we've done uh, two <clears throat> conjugate distributions. We've done um, basically like binomial issues where or binomial problems, right? Where the, the outcomes are a success and a failure. And so that was, we used a beta binomial conjugate. Uh, we did kind of a um, count type of statistic uh, uh, counts over a certain period of time. So a rate type of statistic where we used a gamma Poisson um, conjugate distribution. And today we're going to go through, we save the best for last, probably the most commonly used distribution in all of statistics, the normal distribution. And we're going to use a normal to normal conjugate. And the reason why we save this one for last uh, is twofold. One, it's tricky to make this little shortcut work because you have to make some assumptions, which the assumption is the assumption and it'll work, but it's kind of silly because we don't always have that assumption to make. Um, so we saved it for last because it's tricky. And the second reason is because it's going to dovetail into next week's episode, which is our last episode on Bayes, where we're going to write our own Gibbs sampler and we're going to go through the normal distribution in a, uh, a more clever way to find these uh, parameters. So here we go. Normal to normal conjugate <laughs> episode 102. <laughs> All right. All right. So we've got some pretty standard setup here. Uh, just want to get that in. So we're, we're using library tidyverse for all our data manipulation needs, though most of the functions functionality that we're using is included in base R. So you yeah. don't need a lot of that. Um, and then we're going to do some plotting as we do to help visualize our results. And so we're just going to set our theme to be theme minimal because it looks real nice. Yeah. All right, Patrick, over, back over to you. All right, <laughs> here we go. So the normal distribution, we all know this. Everybody knows this. It has two parameters. It has a mean and a standard deviation. And when we talk about the normal distribution, we talk about the mean as being the center of the distribution. And we talk about the standard deviation being the amount of dispersion around that mean. And this is tricky because for this to work, we have to think about both the mean and standard deviation as being these joint distributions around them. So basically, we have to think of this as saying the mean itself has a center and it has its own dispersion around it. And the standard deviation has its own center and its own dispersion around it. So it has its own mean and standard deviation of the standard deviation, right? So this joint distribution, in order to, uh, to make this work, we, we assign a prior to each of those parameters, meaning we have to have a point estimate and a dispersion, a point estimate and a variance for both the mean and the standard deviation. And this is a continuous distribution. And so in order to apply a conjugate shortcut here, 
we have to make an assumption about one of those parameters. And that assumption is that we have to assume that one of those parameters is known for our data. So you can make the assumption that you know what the population's mean is, or you can make the assumption that you know what the population standard deviation is. You can do either one of those. We're gonna use, we're gonna say that we're gonna assume the population standard deviation is known and it's the mean that gets bounced around. And you'll see what that looks like when we plot it um, coming up here. So we're gonna make the assumption that the, the standard deviation is known. If both parameters are unknown, meaning which is more common, right? We might not know either of the parameters. That's when we use some sort of um, uh, Monte Carlo approach, for example, Gibbs sampling. And uh, we estimate both by sampling from the posterior distributions. And we're gonna do that next week. We're gonna build a function that is our own Gibbs sampler. We call it Ellis's Gibbs sampler. And we're gonna build that function. <laughs> and we're gonna use it. Yeah. So let's, let's create a problem statement so that we can work through this. So um, Ellis and I are uh, the general managers of a new basketball team. And we created this cool metric that rates the efficiency of the players on this sort of plus minus scale. So the metric is centered at zero. Um, so we're saying that the average player is zero and then the players go out and they play and they either play well or they play poorly and they go up or down in this plus minus fashion. So our prior for this new efficiency score is that our population for our population is that the mean is zero. And we believe that that, that mean has some dispersion around it. And so we assign it a standard deviation of one. That's our prior. Our prior belief is that the mean is moving up and down by about one around zero. Now we have to assume a population standard deviation and we assume that to be 2.5, right? We assume that the, st the population standard deviation is known. Remember, both the mean and the standard deviation will have their own distributions. We're assuming that the standard deviation distribution is known and it's 2.5 and we want to determine the value of a new player that we have acquired based on observing a few games and his performance so first let's kind of check out what the normal distribution is and how it looks so we have a our prior mean of zero and our dispersion around that mean of one and we're just going to um ellis why don't you walk through uh, uh the the uh sampling function here and then the plotting sure thing all right so we use our r norm function so that's the random values from the normal distribution so that's what the r stands for it's random uh it has a couple different parameters and this is similar across all, all the distributions where the first one is n so this is the number of samples we want to be taking so here we're going to be taking a hundred thousand samples but then after that, these are the values for the distribution. And for normal distribution, we have the mean and the standard deviation. And so mu, our prior mu, is a, the mean here, so that's zero. And then we have our standard deviation, and that's the uh, mu SD, which is one that we calculated here. So right now, now it's going to run through and pull out 100,000 random values from a distribution of a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. We're going to then throw this into the plot function. We're first going to calculate density, which is going to show us uh, the density plot of, of these normal values. Uh, it's going to be colored blue. It's going to have a relatively thick line weight. And the title is going to be prior density. So run that. And so this is the density of the values that we have here. That's and nice. So centered around zero. And you can see that approximately a one standard deviation so if you move out one that's like 67 right percent of values then one two standard, standard, two 95 standard deviations that was 95 and as you go out the it, it just uh, drops off yep and it's pretty much close to zero yep there you go cool all right so uh we can what can we do with our uh with our you know, prior density here. Well, we can ask questions like, what's the probability of observing a player who has an efficiency score of five plus five, right? Given our prior known and mu and, and standard deviation. So we, we have our known, remember our known population standard deviation is 2.5. There we so go. So we set that in. 
And so now we use the denorm function to say, hey, can you tell me um, the density underneath 0.5? So remember, if you think about that blue distribution that Ellis just plotted, um, if we could bring that back, what we're saying is all the way out there. So we see 0.4, we actually don't even see 0.5, but we're saying, hey, how much how much distribution is underneath 0.5 here plus 0.5 how much distribution is underneath that and so we can ask that question with this denorm function so we're saying the point we're interested in is five the point in the distribution we're interested in five this is the distribution information and can you tell us what the probability is and so the probability is about 2.2 percent with a prior mean of zero and a known standard deviation of 2.5 we can solve this by hand if you've ever opened up your statistics book this is the equation that you'll see when they're like hey we're going to talk about the normal distribution here's this ugly equation that's what that ugly equation looks like in code i just wrote it out here in case you ever wanted to see um, see how it works. You can make this little function here. So basically the function is taking a, the observed value X, the, uh, the mean that we're interested in and the standard deviation that we're interested in. So it's taking the exact same arguments as our denorm function that R provides us with. And under the hood of that denorm function, this is what it looks like. We actually just write out um, all of the math that helps us um, expose the density underneath the point X that we're interested in. So if we run that function and we run it, we get the exact same value. 2.3 should be exact. Yeah, they're cool. identical. They're identical. All right. So <clears throat> that's a little bit about the normal distribution. Let's just, before we move on to apply our conjugate, let's just go through this so that we make it very clear. We are assuming that the standard deviation is 2.5 points. So let's say that we have a bunch of athletes and they have varying levels of average player efficiency. One, negative one, two, negative two, and three, negative three. We're assuming 2.5 in the population is the standard deviation. So we're going to run all those values. These are different players. We're going to put them into a data frame using that R norm function. Again, we're taking 100,000 samples. And then we're going to plot each of these distributions. And what you're going to see is they're going to have their own respective centers, their own respective means. And they're all going to have the same amount of variance just at different levels of mean. So you can see the one, the negative one, the two, the negative two, the three, and the negative three. And so that's how this conjugate approach to the normal distribution is going to work. We're saying that we don't know, we're saying that we want to estimate the mean and the means variance. And we're saying that we assume to know what the population standard deviation is. And we're gonna use that information right now to observe some player values and make an assumption on their performance. All right, so let's go. Uh, that just goes over everything I just said, <laughs> wrote it there for you. Um, so we're gonna work with our variance. We're gonna work with our standard deviation in a, in a new way. So we can parameterize the spread around the mean in one of three ways. We can express it as a standard deviation, which we've done. We can express it as a variance, which we've done in previous lectures where it's just standard deviation squared. Or we can express it as a precision, which we'll call tau. And that's calculated as one over the variance. So the inverse of the variance. And so this precision we will use in the equations as tau, and if we scroll down, we're gonna organize our data. So we're ready to tackle this problem. We have two pieces of prior information about our population. We know that the population mean is zero and around that distribution of the mean, there is a standard deviation of one. <clears throat> and so we're gonna set that up. So we have a mean, a standard deviation, which we convert to tau by dividing one over the variance. And so now we have those three values for our prior. We also know that we have a assumed standard deviation for the population of which we don't need to, uh, we're not making any sort of estimates on its own distribution. We're just assuming that we know it and we're assuming that it's 2.5. And we're gonna also turn that into a precision value, one divided by the variance, 2.5 squared, <clears throat> okay. And now we're going to observe some uh, performance of our player. He, 
This player is very uh, has a, has a high amount of variance, some good games and some bad games. So we run this. <laughs> We have a mean and a standard deviation. So the player has a lot of variance and a rather high mean. And so how confident are we that this player is about one and a half points better than the league average of zero? How confident are we in that given these, you know, five games and that, that wild variance, let's calculate the posterior and figure it out. We're going to apply our conjugate shortcut. And the mean for this posterior is calculated as such. So we take our, prior precision and multiply it by our prior mean. So that's the prior values going in, knowing nothing. That's our base rate. <clears throat> we add that to the sum of the assumed population standard deviation multiplied by the observations that we just made for our player. And then we divide all of that by the um, prior precision plus, again, the number of observations multiplied by the assumed standard deviation. So we're weighting that assumed population standard deviation by the number of observations we've seen. More observations means more confidence. We've only had five here. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can then calculate the standard deviation around this player's mean as the posterior tau, and that's taking our prior posterior, our prior precision plus the N observed, so a number of observations weighted by, are the, the uh, known pre precision, the known assumed tau, the known precision weighted by the number of observations that we have. That's going to give us our posterior uh, precision. And then using some algebra, we can convert this back to a standard deviation. So there is what tau equals. We do a little bit of um, algebraic magic by moving things from left and right sides of the uh, equal sign. And that gets us to a standard deviation that equals the square root of one divided by tau. And rather than doing these step by step and trying to keep them all in our head, we are going to write a nice little function that is going to calculate all of this out for us. And I'll call that function the normal conjugate posterior. It's going to take, <laughs> yeah, it's going to take four observations. It's going to take our prior mean, our prior standard deviation, and it's going to take our assumed population standard deviation and then the observations for this individual player. And so going through this function line by line, the first thing we do is we um, get the number of observations so that the, that's the length of our vector of observations. Uh, I do the numerator and denominator in two steps because I like to make sure that I get the math right and it allows me to check things easier. So there's our numerator, uh, which we just went over uh, up above and the denominator yep, for the mean. Yep. So there's the numerator and the denominator. We divide the numerator by the denominator and that gives us our posterior mean. We calculate our posterior precision and then we convert that posterior precision back to a standard deviation, and then we bundle them all up into this nice little data frame that returns back to us the mean standard deviation and precision of our posterior. So we run that function. Yeah, and this just this just makes it easier, so we don't have to do all the all these calculations multiple times and copy and paste it and potentially introduce bugs. Error. In our code. Yeah. Um. So now we're ready to run our function, and. Um, it's as easy as assigning each of those arguments, the values that we set before. So our prior mean, our prior standard deviation, our assumed standard deviation, and our five observations of our player. And when we run this function, we get some posterior values. So we get a posterior mean. So remember, originally it was 1.6 was our, our, our observations. There was a mean of 1.6 and a standard deviation of 1.7. And now what we've done is we've constrained this athlete down towards the normal, uh, the base rate of what we expect for the athletes within this basketball team um, so that we're not too bullish on his performance given only five observations and given a lot of variance. We can yeah. also calculate a 95% credible interval here or so there we go. We see still a lot of distribution because of, of, you know, who the player is. 
um, given how you know how variable he was over those five games. And we can make some cool plots. Ellis, you want to walk through plotting the posterior here? Sure thing. So we're going to continue to use our R norm distribution function because uh, that's the density or the distribution that we're working with here. We're going to continue to use 100,000 values. This first one is going to be the prior sim. So this is the generic uh, simulation where the prior mu is zero and the mu SD is just one. So we'll calculate this and this is the, the base. We don't have any information about the player. Uh, then we have our posterior sim. So this is now that we've run it through our uh, algorithm. So we now have the player's mu and the player's uh, standard deviation. And we're gonna also simulate that a thousand times. Um, we're going to throw it into uh, our plot here. We're going to use the density function to calculate, uh, to give us a nice uh, density line there. It's going to be blue, and this is for the prior. So this is the uh, standard deviation of one and mu of zero. Then we're going to plot over that the player's individual simulation, and then we're going to add a vertical line at zero so we can look at the shift between the two of them. So, all right, so we give that a second. All right, there we go. So you can see that blue line is centered around zero. And this player looks like, you know, likely to have games that are above average. Yeah, but, but we're, we're not, not as bullish as we were before. Mm -hmm. It's not as bullish as the frequentist, which would be over more like yeah. over here. Mm -hmm. But this is this is pulled back a little bit. So another way you could look at this is what are the number of games where they'll be above average? So above zero. And so this is saying roughly 85% of the games we could expect the player to be above average. So like mm -hmm. confident, like we're pretty happy, but it's only been five games. So we're not like sold. Yeah. So what if we observe five more games? We right. can use some Bayesian updating. So we observe some games here and clearly the player was much better in these games with the exception of one of them. Um, this, you know, now starts to look like maybe we've, maybe we've got a player here. So we're going to observe those games and we're going to update what we know. Now, the key here to remember is that the assumed tau is not changing. Remember, that is assumed. That is fixed for the population. So we're not going to change that. The, what, what does change is our prior mean and our prior standard deviation of that mean because we've already observed five games for this player and we've updated our knowledge. Remember the blue line in the plot is representing what we expect for a player given no information. We've gotten some information and that's where we see the red plot. And we're gonna use that information to our advantage as our new uh, prior for this individual. So we're gonna take the posterior mean and the posterior tau from the previous you know, calculation and we're gonna set those as our new uh, our new priors, right? So we're saying that this is a prior that is unique to this player now. It's not unique to the population where we had no observations. So we're going to run that function again with the new observations and the new priors for the mean and the standard deviation. And we get... Oops, oh, if I run that code first. There we go. And we get an outcome now where we're saying, oh, okay, this is not bad. This player is probably about a 1.3 in efficiency with a standard deviation of a little over half a point. And we can again calculate out our, our uh, credible intervals or quantile intervals. Now it's looking like this player might be pretty darn good. Ellis, you wanna walk through plotting now all three of these distributions for the player? Sure thing. So the only time, because we saved everything as a vector before, we don't need to rerun those. All we have to do is rerun it for now this new posterior. Um, and so we're gonna once again use our norm. We're gonna calculate 10,000 random samples, this time using this new posterior mu and the new posterior SD. So yeah. we're gonna generate those values. Same values as before, where we're gonna plot the prior sim as blue, the, um, the first five games as red, but this time we're gonna add over this, these new five games as a green line. So let's plot that, plot that, plot that. And then we're also gonna add an AB line at zero so we can look at that distribution. So we can look at that and we can see the line because we're a lot more confident in the player because we've now seen more games where they're consistently playing higher at, at a higher level that they've mm -hmm. now moved, shifted over a little bit. 
Yep. And you can update this after every game if you want it. And it'll start to dance back and forth a little bit until you've seen, you know, maybe 30 or 40 games or something like that. It starts to normalize in, and then you're probably thinking like, oh, you know, this is this is LeBron James or something like that. Like it's really, you know, normalized. This is the next next top player. All right. And then we can do the same sort of thing that we did a lot, uh, before or where first we calculated, uh, you know, on 85 percent of the games or so, we'd expect them to, to play at above average rate um, efficiency. But this time now using our, our new posterior we expect them 98.5% of the time to play at a higher level than uh, the average player. So yeah. on average, they're going to be good. <laughs> a good player. Good player for our team. Yeah, exactly. And, and so that's that's normal that's to normal it. cons. You get, again, there's a lot of situations where we don't want to make the assumption that we know what the population standard deviation is, and we want to jointly simulate or in sample from both of those parameters. Next week, we're going to write a give sampler function by hand. That's going to let us do that. And probably that'll be the end of our Bayes series, yeah. unless we get into like regressions hey, and you know, it, comparisons. If this is something that y'all want to see, let us yeah, know. We can do comments, more. We can do more. Comments but, down below. Uh, yeah. We want to we know what y'all want to, or we want to do what you want to see. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we've gotten some pretty great feedback on the Bayes uh, series. Y'all definitely really liked uh, the stuff early on, um, but we want to make sure that this is still what you want to see. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so I think with that, I guess we're going to call it. Thank you all for joining us for 102 episodes of Tidy X. As always, my name is Ellis Hughes, and you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick at tidy underscore explained is where tidy x is on twitter tidy dot explained at gmail.com is where tidy x is at gmail um github you can open up an issue if you want to or you can go to the youtube channel like and subscribe comment on the link below or in the in the comments below uh, and if you appreciate our work and want to contribute we do have a patreon page and uh, we thank everybody who has uh, contributed this far we really do appreciate it all right, thank you all so much and keep on exploring your world. <laughs>